Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Philip Mudd is a former deputy director of the CIA for counterterrorism. He was also the number two man at the FBI security branch. He's written about his experiences uh, in a book called Takedown, Inside the Hunt for Al-Qaeda, and we are happy to welcome him on this show today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, for being here. Well, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't start out the interview by talking about the uh, occurrences uh, in Paris uh, of, mm -hmm. over the past month at uh, Charlie uh, Ebedo and the attack there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take? Is this, uh, was this really Europe's 9-11 in a sense? I'm not sure it was. I do think it's a wake-up call in terms of our concerns that we would see terrorism emanating from now the long wars in Syria and Iraq. Back when we faced the Al-Qaeda adversary, when I went back to the CIA from the White House in 2002, we knew we had a relatively small enemy that was Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but that had years to build up to the 911 tragedy. Mm -hmm. What's happened in the 15 years since is you've seen these war zones develop and you have organizations that still want to target things like that magazine, uh, the London subway in 2005, they still want to come after New York or Chicago, Washington, but they don't have the same kind of central organization we witnessed 15 years ago. They're far more diffuse, in other words. Mm -hmm. So the threat might be less strategic. They're not spending three years plotting to take down four aircraft, but the fact that it's dispersed among, among so many Europeans who are going out to train mm -hmm. makes it harder to follow. It's hard to follow a 1,000 people who go out there, usually via Turkey, via Jordan, to train because that's too many people for a security service to keep track of. You know, there is something that, that really stuck with me that you said. You, you said that a lot of people mistake uh, emotion for analysis. And I think one of the emotional issues that, that, that's going on right now is, uh, and, and you see this with the French, mm -hmm. they're trying to look at the fact that there are uh, Muslims in their society. Mm -hmm. And then they have these large areas of Muslims in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, in, particularly in the Saint-Denis uh, section. Mm -hmm. and, and they're looking at that and they're trying to balance what they know is, is just and free about mm -hmm. their society mm -hmm. with a kind of uh, common sense about what they think may be going on. And mm -hmm. I mean, it, there, there are certain things that remind us in the Charlie Hebdo thing. Uh, uh, there was a Muslim policeman who was executed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the terrorists. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, uh, a Muslim who helped uh, uh, save 15 Jews mm -hmm. in, a, in a freezer in the, uh, in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are difficult issues. These are incredibly difficult issues. They are, but I think one of the reasons they're difficult is because they're new and they're hard for us to understand in terms of the randomness of the violence we see with terror attacks. You take the Boston bombings, for example. Mm -hmm. 52 miles, if you take up and back of territory, two guys just get a pressure cooker and can wreak havoc. What I try to tell folks is, look, in this country, we have a long history of dealing with violence that we've accepted. There's a far more violent culture in America, including in Memphis and its environs, than you would see in Europe. That violence comes from gangs, comes from drug activity, but we've come to accept it as part of life, especially in urban America. Mm -hmm. We now have a different kind of violence that we do not have a history of that we're not that familiar with. We don't understand the origins of it. We don't understand this small thread of radical Islam that has brought this here. So I think sometimes it's taken out of context because it's so new. If you put it in the context of other violence you see in America, as an analyst, I look at it coldly and say, you know, if you want to worry about terrorism, and I'm a, I spent 25 years in the terrorism business, the counterterrorism business, you're free to do so. If you want to take a cold-blooded analytic look and put it in the context of other violence we see in America, I'd worry about a lot of other things first because the, the likelihood that terrorism will affect an American family is very low. You wouldn't think that watching the TV every night. The right. likelihood that gangs or violent crime or drugs will affect a family, much higher. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you, you know, you make a point about the kind of terrorists that, that we're seeing now as opposed to the kind of terrorists that you saw when you incarcerated people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. That's right. Right after tw uh, 2001. I think there's been a fundamental shift. When we first started running CIA detention facilities, which have now come into the public domain in the past few years, mm -hmm. I remember talking when I was at CIA to some of our interrogators. And you know, you'd sit down outside the formal process of, of interrogating a prisoner when our interrogators would come back to CIA headquarters. And I'd say, you know, just talk to me. Mm -hmm. What do you see when you're talking to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, when you're talking to some of the other guys we've taken down? And, 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 and it should be pointed out, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the architect, the architect for 911. That's yeah. right, and, and the operational commander just below the level of the top two in Al Qaeda. Mm. And what the interrogators would say is, we see commitment, we see drive, we see brains. You would think that these are sort of terrorist masterminds might have a screw loose. They do not. Not the ones we took down after 911. Very committed people, very ideological, and very smart. I remember thinking and, and reading some of the stuff that I saw coming across my desk, and I'm going to take a guess, 05, 06 time frame, that the kinds of people who were getting recruited into terror organizations, at that point a lot of people were going to fight in Iraq, people from the Arabian Peninsula, people from North Africa, that there had been a transition, that the people we were seeing, 18, 20, 22, were motivated by emotion, not the ideology of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Osama bin Laden, but mm -hmm. they'd see an image on a TV. They'd see an allegation that a woman was raped by a U.S. soldier, and the switch would go on, and they'd say, I've got to go defend my people. I've got to go defend women and children in Iraq or Afghanistan. So to me, that was a foundational shift in the counterterror campaign, the shift from real ideologues in the core of al-Qaeda to more emotionally driven people who were recruited afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you made a point uh, dur during the uh, Boston uh, bombing mm -hmm. with the two brothers. Uh, that it, it resembled more the uh, the shootings at uh, the high school mm -hmm. than it was anything else. Uh, that uh, these were people who had no real escape plan. I know. think I think that's true, and I got some hate mail for that because people want to focus on aspects of these terror crimes. That is, what is the Islamic motivation instead of looking coldly at what happens in terror cells. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a cold look at what happens in these cells, especially in the latter years of the terror war outside the Al-Qaeda campaign of 2001, 2002. As you get to the periphery of this Al-Qaeda movement, you get what I would say is a cult culture. In this case, a couple of brothers, they say, I'm angry. They might watch a few videos. They might travel someplace, get some rudimentary training. But their knowledge of the ideology of Al-Qaeda, their knowledge even of their own religion is relatively limited. I compared the Boston event to Columbine because I saw, if you will, almost a cult of a a couple of people who said, we want to execute an operation in Boston, but I think if you talk to the one surviving brother, remember one died in that event, right. if you talk to the one surviving brother, you would quickly realize he doesn't know a lot about what he's talking about. He's not that well steeped in the ideology of Al-Qaeda, and he's not that well steeped in the religion of Islam. So that's why I started to say, this looks to me like some, in some ways a cult as opposed to sort of religious cells motivated by Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go back to something you said earlier about about uh, interrogating some of the original mm -hmm. terrorists like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, these have been talked about as being enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, yeah. uh, former Vice President Cheney uh, uh, has said uh, that he believes that that these produced actionable intelligence. Yeah. Uh, but you see it more as being. Uh, a mosaic, That's uh, right. a piece in the puzzle. Uh, expand on that. Well, I, I think, and as I watched the debate publicly, especially recently, in the wake of there was a Senate report about what the CIA did. The Senate report was very critical. It's called the Senate Torture Report about what we did at CIA. Partly when I was there. Mm -hmm. People watch TV and have the impression that when you get a detainee, he might come in, and if you're successful with that detainee, you can get gems of information that lead you to stop the next plot. That is a TV version of intelligence. It's not the world of intelligence I lived. The C CSI version. The CSI right? version, yeah, right? Yeah. 24. I get asked about those. <laughs> I've never seen them, but I gather they're quite dramatic. The world <laughs> I lived in was occasionally dramatic, but often more mundane. And the reason is this. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at either your life or the life of a viewer or the life of a terrorist, there are common characteristics. You talk on the phone. You talk to friends. You email. You text. There are a variety of ways I can capture snippets of information about your life, independently taken, those snippets, a phone call, for example, mm -hmm. 
don't give me a very good picture of who you are, where you're traveling, the kinds of things I want to know as a counterterrorism guy because we want to capture you. Taken together, those snippets start to give you a more complete three-dimensional picture of someone's life that helped me plan a takedown operation. Mm -hmm. So again, people are looking at the detainee information saying, where are the huge gems? Where are the diamonds that led you to the next plot? And mm -hmm. I look at folks and say, if that's what you're thinking, no wonder you're disappointed. That's not how intelligence works. It's a bunch of boring bits that taken together slowly come into focus and give me a picture of a life. Taken independently, they're not going to mean anything. Mm -hmm. You were on the fast track of, of uh, uh, accepting a Homeland Security job. Yeah, and you was, past tense. Was, was. <laughs> yes. But, but you took yourself out of the running. Yeah. Was, was part of it the fact that, that everything had become so emotional in terms of that issue? Uh, uh, it, yes, the, the issue for me, and this is going back, if I don't even remember my own life, to about 2009 was, you know, it, I, I entered as an entry-level CIA officer, what's called a GS-9, which is a fairly low rank in the CIA, and mm -hmm. I grew to, to have the privilege of both serving in the Bush White House for Bush 43 mm -hmm. in 2001, but also being nominated by President Obama for the head of intelligence at the Department of Homeland Security. Now, in my world as an intelligence officer, that is an incredible honor to have the president there nominate you for a position. Mm -hmm. But very yes. quickly, what came to pass was that these positions require Senate confirmation. That is, you sit in a chair and get grilled by senators on a camera on C-SPAN forever. Mm -hmm. And the senators started to say, we don't really care about your qualifications for this assignment at Homeland Security. We care that you were there when CIA was interrogating prisoners. Mm -hmm. And you're the only guy we're going to be able to get on camera because you're a, you're a presidential nominee for this job and grill. Mm -hmm. And I said, personally, I, I, I don't like to say this, but personally, let's go. I'm ready to take that. Professionally, it seemed inappropriate for me to serve a president whom I had never met at that point by starting with an embarrassment on the front page of the Washington Post that says, hey, look at this show down at Senate. The president nominated someone who's being grilled about interrogation techniques, and it's an embarrassment. So I said, personally, I'd like the interrogation by the Senate. Professionally, I think it would be a courtesy of the president yeah. to withdraw. So and I did. In a sense, you were tipped off. Uh, uh, didn't somebody tell you that if you... If you went down there, I can't remember the exact yeah. wording of it. What, what, what did they say? They started to talk some, of, I, I don't know exactly who these folks were, but uh, some of the members on the Senate committee started to talk to the press and said, show up for these hearings because there's going to be blood on the floor here. We're going to take this guy and we're going to sort of, we're going to give him some rough treatment. And mm -hmm. so yeah, this yeah. started appearing in the press and I realized that, again, personally, it might be interesting to engage in that debate with the senators, but professionally, it didn't seem appropriate. Right, right. Well, you, the, the, uh, again, since I have you here, I'd be yeah. missing a bunch of opportunities if I didn't ask you about some of the things that we've been seeing coming up in in foreign policy. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular, uh, as this program is being taped, uh, the Yemeni government mm -hmm. uh, is in the process of unraveling or has partly, partially unraveled. And they have the reputation as being uh, one of our staunchest allies mm -hmm. because that is where Al-Qaeda on the uh, Arabian Peninsula mm -hmm. is headquartered. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think the effect of this is going to be if y Yemeni topples? Potentially pretty serious. Here's the way this situation plays out. When you're trying to run operations against Al-Qaeda, the Arabian Peninsula, in a sort of no man's land, uh, Yemen, some of parts of of Yemen are inhospitable, hard to get in there. Mm -hmm. Working in partnership with the local security service gives you access in terms of everything from the language, the culture, even the ability to enter geographic areas that you know, an American intelligence officer can't enter mm -hmm. that are, you, you can't replace those opportunities. Uh, the job of intelligence against Al Qaeda is to understand the adversary and map their locations well enough to go after them. Mm -hmm. So having that local partner is critical to doing that mapping exercise. When that local partner disappears, and that's going to happen when the government falls, the security service falls as well, the ability to collect intelligence on that Al Qaeda presence declines as well. Now, I think the problem we'll see in Yemen, or potentially the opportunity is, there are also local partners who are remain heavily, seriously opposed to Al-Qaeda, and potentially in the future they can help us collect intelligence that will supplement what the government, what the Yemeni government used to give us. But the loss of a lo local partner when you're trying to penetrate areas where people like me aren't welcome is pretty critical. Mm. Uh, 
you know, when you talk about people like yourself and, and you think about the CIA, you mm. also think about assets on the ground. Yeah. And, um, and it also looks at, uh, it also makes me think about drones for a second, mm. because in the sense that uh, drones have been a tool in the toolbox, certainly, yeah. has there been an overuse of them? And I mean, can they ever really replace a, a good asset on the ground? You've got to have both in, in uh, sort of working together. The way the drone program works, and I think it's been incredibly effective. There's obviously a debate about where to use drones. Do you use them in places you're not at war? We've used them in Somalia, for example, where we're not engaged in a war on the ground. Others are, including African forces. Do you use them in other scenarios? For example, would you ever use them against the drug cartel? I mm -hmm. believe you should. I mean, drug cartels to me are a bigger threat mm -hmm. to America than terrorism ever will be. If you look at what happens in, in American border states. Well, we're seeing the destabilization of a country. That's correct. Yeah. But the importance of drones working together with human sources is the human sources and what we call technical intelligence, that's things like phone intercepts, email intercepts, allow you to find a target. Who's the individual you want to go after and where is he located on the map? If you can't gain access to that territory because the U.S. military is not engaged or because it's in an area where the U.S. military can't get to, I remember sitting back saying, what option do we have? Mm -hmm. People say drones create more terrorists than they eliminate. And I would say if you see somebody in an inhospitable area sort of orchestrating a terror attack and you can't get U.S. Special Forces or Big Green, the Army in there, mm -hmm. to disrupt that attack, what are you going to do? Are you going to let that op that terror planning go forward because you don't want to use drones? I, I thought they were an imperfect solution, but I couldn't figure out, and those of us in the business I think would all agree on this, I couldn't figure out a better way to take out the target in an area we couldn't reach than a drone. Mm -hmm. And so to my mind, they've been critically effective in eliminating leadership in places like Yemen, Somalia, and the tribal areas of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, that's a troubling area, the tribal areas of, of Pakistan. In yeah. a way, it's kind of like, uh, and, and I'm speaking, uh, you, you know, as a layman who gets to sit down in the comfort of his living room, yeah. uh, but it always struck me as almost being the dark side of the moon in the sense that how do you unravel the allegiances that are out there? I mean, it's it's amazing. The British found the same thing when they were uh, when they were looking at it in the early part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and, and little has changed. Little it's, has changed. I think we were yeah. talking earlier about the importance of local partners in Yemen. Same holds true. It's almost identical in the tribal areas of Pakistan. You, you talk about tribal linkages that go back centuries and the inability of someone like me to step in, even with great experience, and try to sort that out. Because some of those allegiances are changing very quickly, day-to-day, mm -hmm. week-to-week, month-to-month. So regardless of, the, of whether the local security service is somebody you admire, and I know there's been a lot of criticism of the CIA over the years for working with local security services that had questionable reputations, if you want to go into a place like Pakistan or Yemen to operate, you need the local guys to say, what, it, what are the factions here? How do we understand changing factions? And how do we insert people into that environment safely so they can help us identify the people we have to go after with the level of granularity that we know what house they're in, because that's where drones come in. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is inhospitable, and that's why working with the Pakistanis, who are a, an up and down partner, is really critical. Mm -hmm. uh, since the time uh, that you've left the CIA, that threat map has gotten larger. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're seeing uh, we're, we're seeing what happens as some of the factions from the Syrian civil war are now expanding outwards towards Iraq. Yeah. And, and of course, I'm referring to ISIL. Yeah. Uh, did we miss an opportunity in Syria, do you think? You know, I think there's two ways to look at this. As a practitioner, I hate whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, communist, whatever you are, as someone who sat in the chair looking back and saying, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, I'm hesitant to do that because I've sat there and had the same thing done to me. But I, I think historians will look back at turning points early on in the in the Syrian campaign, particularly after Bashar al-Assad, mm -hmm. the president of Syria, used chemical weapons against his own people. And, and I think they will say, you know, if there had been a more head-on intervention by the Americans, I'm not talking about U.S. forces, I'm talking about a major assistance program to the opposition to Assad, mm -hmm. maybe some of this instability we see now three, four years down the road would have been contained. I think that's possible. I remember sitting back there saying, you know, boy, when you see this level of brutality against a people, 
if we, if we don't want to intervene militarily, are there other ways we can help? And then we decided to step back. I, I think it was a mistake, but again, I'm, I'm, as a practitioner, I'm really hesitant to look back and tell folks it's easy. It's easy. It would have been easy to do it then. It's never easy. These mm -hmm. situations are complicated. I'm not sure what the outcome would have been had we intervened, but I think most practitioners might look at it like me and say, that was an opportunity lost early on. It's too late now, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, which brings me to your book. Mm -hmm. And it also brings me to those first days after 9-11. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you ended up going into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the things that struck me when I was reading the book is the amount of the amount of, uh, for lack of a better technical term, stuff that you guys <laughs> ended up doing yeah. in such a short period of time. You yeah. were back home by Christmas. Yeah. And one of the things, one of the things uh, in, in the book that I wanted to bring up was, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty. Yeah. And people forgetting sometimes the context of the feelings mm -hmm. that were going on at the time. Uh, you you get into Afghanistan, and one of the things that you're helping to do is uh, locate somebody who could be a leader. Yep. And a lot of people today say Karzai. Yeah. You know, uh, this guy. You know, I mean, uh, they they're almost amateur es experts. But yeah. at the time, when you went in, uh, there was almost a consensus so uh, far and wide about this fellow. That's right. I mean, people now, for those who follow this area and watch the transition in Afghanistan recently from president to president, look at Karzai all these years later and say, hey, the president of Afghanistan that you sort of settled on back in 2001 turned out to be not the best deal ever. Mm -hmm. I look at him and say, especially after career intelligence and career and in ugly stuff, the whole world looks gray to me. There is no white and black. There is no good and evil. There's a bunch of ugly stuff out there. Mm -hmm. When we first went in, I was part of a small diplomatic team into Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. The country was falling quickly to the Northern Alliance, backed by U.S. forces. That is the anti-Taliban alliance. And people were saying, it's falling quickly to this military alliance. There's a political vacuum. Who's going to take control of this country if the Taliban disappears? Within the space of 90 days, we're there. I remember on December 23rd of 2001 at the inauguration, one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had. I went to President <laughs> Karzai's inauguration. Mm -hmm. When we traveled to Central Asia, South Asia, into Afghanistan, into Europe, talking to everybody who was anybody, mm -hmm. very quickly in that period of time, a consensus emerged, as you said. There's this one guy, we think he'd work. So people who look back in retrospect and say he didn't work out perfectly 13 years down the road, I'm scratching my head saying, you have got to be kidding me. Why don't you sit back there in the fall of 2001, have everybody miraculously settle on a guy who spoke good English, pretty good guy. And this is coming from most of the people who are trying to kill each correct. other. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you sit back there and say, hey, you know, maybe we should sit around for another six months and come up with a more perfect candidate. I mean, it's laughable, some of the commentary I see. Now, obviously, he didn't end up being a perfect leader. I thought he'd ended up pretty well, frankly, given the cards he was mm -hmm. dealt. It is Afghanistan, a broken culture. Mm -hmm. But uh, boy, that was, if you had told me in t uh, when we first went in in the fall of 01, by December 23rd, we're going to be at a swearing-in ceremony for somebody who's accepted that is Karzai by all regional governments, I would have said, you're nuts. I'll take that in a minute. <laughs> you, you, you make an interesting case in the book about why pursuing bin Laden was important. Yeah. But the, the more important priority was breaking up long-term plots and That's right. cells. That's uh, right. Uh, expand on that. Well, I remember talking to friends in the business because we were busted all the time in 03, 04, 05. Where's bin Laden? Where's bin Laden? Where's bin Laden? I remember my boss at, back then, the head of operations, saying, you know, if anybody, the next person who says, where's bin Laden, I'm going to shoot him. And he said he went home that night and his wife said, where's bin Laden? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I tell folks is when you're in a difficult situation, you better have simple mission focus. Mm -hmm. You need simple mission focus to make sure you don't start drifting off. The mission focus was make sure we don't have another catastrophic event in this country. Hmm. Stop. End. The catastrophic events that were being plotted were a level below bin Laden. I'm not saying it wasn't involved, but the operational commanders who were actually training and directing operatives to come back to Europe 
the European United States College, Sheikh Mohammed. People you don't know, but I did. I lived with them. Hamza Rabia, Abu Faraj Al Libi. Mm -hmm. These guys were responsible for the next plot. So I thought we had a bin Laden hunt operation on, but we better get to the operational commanders in the top tier of Al Qaeda operators even more quickly, if anything, than bin Laden, because those are the guys who are sitting on plots that'll be the next 911. And in retrospect, I think we're right. The lack of catastrophic events in the United States is remarkable. Well, the clock is kind of winding down on this program, yeah. but there's a couple of things that I that I did want to ask you. You have a new book coming out in April. I do. Um, yeah. I, I used to watch a lot of mistakes in the intelligence business. We're not supposed to advertise mistakes, but how we made mistakes in thinking. A lot mm -hmm. of complicated questions like Syria, like Yemen. And so finally I sat down and said, what did I learn about how to break down complex problems and avoid mistakes? And I talked to a publisher and said, why don't we write a book, and I called it The Head Game, about how to train your head to break down a complex problem so every time you walk in the room, you don't scratch your head and say, I don't know how to deal with this one. Hmm. And so, yeah, it's coming out April 6th. Well, that should be interesting. Thank Looking you. forward to that. Thank uh, you. The half hour has just gone by so quickly, and uh, and you've been a wonderful guest. Thank and you. I hope you come back at some future date. That was a lot us. of fun. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.